Mach 3, give me crew show on 2, 3, and 4. Mach 3, give me start line 2. 5 electric. Mach 3, give me start line 1 and crew show on 7 and 9. Alright, why? Do something. I hate that. Super Ops, line 3, Red Ball, Avionics. Super Ops, line 7 is code 3 for light in the gear handle. So today we're going to have a discussion about uh, kind of running a, a section in an AMU, an aircraft maintenance unit. Uh, I have with me Kenny Brooks, who I served with from 2010 to 2017. He retired from the Air Force in 2017. Uh, we were at Luke Air Force Base in the 308th and Holloman Air Force Base. Um, and I have uh, John Mascolino down in, the, in my screen, bottom right, but... Uh, whatever it comes up for everybody else. Uh, we were section chiefs together at Holloman in the spec section. Um, and we kind of faced a lot of the same stuff together uh, and came up with some good plans. So I wanted to invite him for the conversation because I think it brings a good perspective. Uh, Andrew Farr down in uh, the last person, uh, he worked for me in the 308 uh, back in 2010 to 2011, I think. Yep, uh, with, and with Kenny Brooks. Yeah, with Kenny Brooks. <laughs> Uh, he's he's now a section chief. He's currently still serving. Uh, the rest of us are all retired, and um, he was nice enough to join us from all the way on the other side of the world. So we appreciate you taking getting up early, as the case may be, to talk about all this stupid shit with us. So uh, the point of today's conversation is, is to kind of talk about um, how to run, how to effectively or successfully run a section in an AMU. Uh, and what I did last week with the production conversation was let's talk about what a bad section looks like. What have you seen section chiefs do that's bad? And, and in, in my case, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I did that was terrible. But if anybody wants to jump in, what do you see a shitty section chief do? <laughs> Good <Cricket. laughs> Yeah, I was afraid of this. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> I mean, I'll start. So like okay, I'm, go ahead. I'm, go ahead. I just like uh, I got no idea what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> oh, right now. <laughs> yeah, currently. I just. Oh, so it. you're the you're the perfect. So if you don't know what you're doing, just describe <laughs> what you do, and then we can categorize that in the <laughs> shitty section chief pile, right? <laughs> so I always saw sex. So first of all, for me, section chief was the only job where I looked forward to Mondays and I hated Fridays, which to me was really. Uh, backwards because as a section chief what I would do um, is <laughs> you know as, as your week goes on it uh, goes along as a section chief you have your OIC your assistant in OIC your 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 chief your AMU chief or and maybe some other random person they all walk into your office they give you shit to do that you didn't plan for that you don't have the resources for and you got to scramble to get it done but that accumulates through the week which means by Friday comes around, there's a big pile of shit that you were supposed to do that you had planned to do that you haven't done. There's all the shit they piled on you that they want answers for. So I hated Fridays because that was when I had just a pile of stuff that I didn't know what to do with, and I usually end up coming on the weekends. But what i do is I'd clear that plate on the weekends when I could kind of be left alone, and then Monday would come in, and that would be my chance where I could work on any of the things that I wanted to work on before somebody came in and told me to work on something else. Uh, but as far as like crappy things section chiefs do, and I really should have brought this up in the production meeting too, and I wish I had. I thought about it afterwards. But there is, and this goes for any sort of chain of command or supervisory sort of situation, um, there is a time when your chief is going to tell you to do something, and then you're going to have to turn to one of your people not immediately, but you're going to you have to go to one of your people to implement a process, a program, some discipline or something, something, somewhere where you don't have power to say no. And the worst thing you can do is say, hey, the chief's making me do this. Because what you've just communicated to your guy is you have no fucking power authority. You're agree. just the mouthpiece of your chief, right? So what you need to do is ask the chief when he's coming to you, okay, what are we doing and why? And when he explains it, and if it fucking makes sense, 
you may not necessarily agree with 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 their decision, but if it's logically sound, it might be over, oh, you know, too too strong a, a, an action, or it might not be efficient, or whatever it might be. Um, you you go to your person with the knowledge of why it's being done, and now it's your decision, and you tell the person this is what's going to happen, and this is why, and I need you to go out and do it. Because as soon as you say the chief told me, or the super told me, or the flight chief told me. You've given away that power, and a lot of times when people do that, they're trying to be the good guy. They're trying to be the friend. They're trying to be, I'm on you guys' side against whoever this authority figure is. And that doesn't fucking work at all because now they know you can't do anything. You, you, you disagree with it, but you still do it. Now you're a mouthpiece. You're not a stopping point of authority where things can change or you can advocate for them or you're the, the buck stops with you. You've just rolled over. And now you're the person doing the bidding of the chief, which means that you're the, the chief is by proxy the section chief. And the section chief's just a lever and mechanism of the section. And it shouldn't be that way. But that goes on a lot, though. Oh, fuck yeah, it does. That's why we're talking about it. <laughs> right? Like, I think, like, all my career, that's all I heard was we're it's doing this because out. such and so said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a cop out. Now, don't get me wrong, if the chief is doing something that is illegal or immoral or unethical, then you say fucking no. I'm not going to do that, and I have a list of reasons why I'm not going to do that. And if you make me do it, these are the people I'm going to go to that's going to just push your shit in. That's how this is going to fucking go, right? And if, But if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, then you go to your person and you do it. And then you kind of argue for the space to create your own sort of discipline in your section. What do you... Uh, Drew and Jen, what do you guys think? So I think it kind of came up in the section or the production chat. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you don't have the buy-in, like you have to have the buy-in from your leaders to explain that. And if you don't, then like it's easy. That's the easy route is saying I'm doing this because because fuck you. <laughs> yep. Like if you have if you have the if you've got the reason and you can explain the reason and you have the why. And you can explain that, then it's easy. Yep. I mean, it's Even easy, if it's but it's also hard, right? right? Like it's hard to be the bad guy. It's hard to be the person that's responsible now for whatever that negative or that difficult kind of situation is. But you have to do it because the next time and the next time and the next time and the next time, if you haven't established that it's coming from you, you're fucking yeah. nothing. You've given your power away. So, um, sorry. So I was gonna say, go I ahead. was gonna say that <clears throat> I guess based off of my experience from the section, sec, being a section chief was it was pretty rough AMU to be a section chief in, in my opinion, um, because a lot of things did come down from the from the chief and and as I as I was going, I was learning. So yep, I, I was victim or not victim. I I have I'm guilty of saying that. You know, just yeah. because I had, I, you know, it was a learning curve for me. Like, right. You know, and also I didn't like, know what to do at that point. <clears throat> like I'm going to be, I'm going to be detailing some pretty fucked up shit that I did as a section chief, because the whole point of this is, okay, what were the failures? What were the, what were the accomplishments? I'm going to try to, you know, show all of that, explain why I realized it was a failure, what I wish I would have done instead, because the whole point of this is to give other people the, the, the knowledge we've all kind of gleaned. So, yeah, John. And if you were one of the guys that gave your power away, don't you know? Like, shit don't matter anymore. Like, it's good that we recognize it, Drew. That's just the uh, so. Like, that's just at the AMU level. It's even harder when it's something shitty from the squadron or the group. Yeah. That's do this. I don't know why. Yeah. And then I don't know. Yeah. Well, those no, are good I mean, examples together. <clears throat> Uh, that was a good example. I, I guess jumping, jumping back to the whole um, trying to stand up for for certain things. So um, we we had a rash of throttle grip fails for a while, right. and the chief at the time um, came down to me and said, "Hey, uh, we got to desert your guys, or we got to we got to write them up." I was like, "For what?" It's like for a QA fail. And I was like, "If you do that, you know, he, I got this all mixed up." Anyways. I lost my train of thought. My bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, I was being told to give to write up these my seven levels for a failed QA QA yeah. you know throttle grip inspection, 
it's either that or D cert. So yep. I had the option. And I kind of laid it out there for the chief. I said, hey, uh, before you know it, I'm not going to have anybody to sign right. off these throttle grips. So I'll be decertified. Right. You know, he's like, well, something's got to happen. Otherwise, the group's going to step in and get paperwork. And I'm like. <laughs> right. So basically, your chief was articulating that he didn't have power right off that, the bat. Right. The, and, the then, point, and, yeah. then, and then that's really the, the problem. And I kind of explored that uh, last week when I was talking to Bear about, uh, you know, CFPTPs and 623s and stuff. Or I guess I should say TBA nowadays. But, um, you know, decert is like the knee-jerk reaction to anything and everything. And, and a decert should really be used when this person doesn't know how to do the task. That's right. when a decert is supposed to be done. You decertify them. Basically, either they forgot how to do it or they're never trained properly. You need to go back. and need to get paired up. and They get trained, certified, and now they can do it again. Oftentimes, you would have a you would have a fail of some kind, and the chief would be like, "Decert him," and nobody asked the question if he knew how to. Fu Did he know how to do it and just decided not to fucking do it the right way? Because that's not a certification issue. That's a discipline and punishment issue is what's going on there um and a lot of times they would just they would just jump the gun so when when your chief was coming in your office talking about you know we need to decert them or write them up they're, they're they're already operating from a fucked up position because they're either telling you that they don't trust you to fix the problem right as a section chief because that's really what it, they should come to you and say your guys aren't passing t-grip inspections i need you to find out why and i need you to fix it that's what that's what's supposed to fucking happen if they don't trust you or they're just not trusting individuals or they're micromanaging any of the other things they're going to come in and, and be the fucking puppet master and say okay you're going to desert or you're going to give them locs lors right and then why the fuck do you have a section chief now if your chief's right. going to put their hands in all the minutiae of every fucking section and he wasn't even good at it so it's like what the fuck's going on my problem was that the fail was for a subjective fail. It was one of those measurements on the T-grip. Right. And I was just like arguing like, hey, that was not necessarily a, uh, a major. It wasn't one step away from disaster. And especially, I forget what that, what that gate, I think it was just for the gate to go into burner. Yeah. I forget that dimension. But anyway, um, I was trying to make that argument. And I was like, I'm not going to give him an LOR. I'm not going to desert him for, for something subjective. It's, you know, it's just the flavor of the month for QA. It's one of those things where, you know, everybody's been failing throttle grips. Nobody was able to pass it. Kind of like the engine bay thing. Nobody could ever pass and an engine bay. It's cyclic, and it's a it's a plate that you have to spin like yeah. periodically. Yeah. You know, Kenny was my assistant in uh, uh, in the three ways back in uh, what was it, 2013, where where I asked you to come out of the truck and then come into the office. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time we were kind of fortunate because I think then we had chief Roberts, uh, captain Gramco and we had, uh, Hauser as the assistant. So we had like a pretty good AMU leadership team and I still failed <laughs> a lot, uh, at a lot of different things. Um, but it's a radically different experience when you're a section chief and you have a shitty AMU leadership team that has no ability to stand up to the squadron of the group ha doesn't understand how a section is supposed to be run, doesn't understand how production is supposed to be run, doesn't understand um, the jet. I, I can't count the amount of times. I brought it up in the production section, but it's still a, f a discussion. It's still a problem. But, you know, we had a chief in the 311th who, you know, for two, you know, I got there in 2014. I retired in 2017. I think he was still there. And there were still meetings where he said, well, I really don't know the F-16 that well. And it's like, at some point, you got to fucking sack up and, and learn the jet because you're a fucking chief. Like, it's, it's, that is the most flaccid, limp dick fucking response to what's going on with this. Well, I don't know the jet. Okay, you've been in the Air Force for 39,000 years. Like, you should fucking be able to fi figure out these systems. Um and, you know, when you have a chief that doesn't know the jet, doesn't really understand production, like that was the same guy where I could go in with a 2407 and the content of my 2407 didn't matter because I knew he was going to sign it no matter what it said. Like if you have a, if you have AMU leadership like that, being a section chief is by orders of magnitude way more fucking difficult because, you know, they're just going to keep rolling over to whatever the person above them says. Whereas when I was working with Kenny, 
We had we had a hard stop. We had an offensive or defensive line, whatever you want to call it, at our AMU supervision level that were willing to say, this is our house. We will run our house as we see fit. And we will reach out when we need help from other units or the group or the squadron or whoever. But we will let you know when that time comes. And until then, it's ours. So I've, I've seen both. I've seen the, the, the limp noodle chiefs and then the super hard, you will do it my way, chiefs. And I prefer the latter. Just, it, at least you know what to expect and you don't have to make up stuff yourself. You know what right. I mean? Like there's leadership there. Yep. No, and I don't even – I mean, <laughs> you know, I know what you're talking about where you have the, 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 the noodle and the guy that's hardcore, but there's actually a third kind that is – you know, compassionate, but a leader that keeps outside influences out of your unit. It's fucking rare. It's super rare that you have like compassionate Amy leadership. That's also like running the show. Um, like for me, it was definitely a unicorn. Um, and I'm glad I got to get a lot of my failures out under that leadership team compared. If I would, if I, if I had, you know, me and John, we got paired up when I um, quit being a pro super and asked to go to the spec section. Um, and I think John, you came right out of QA at about. The, so yeah. we, we basically both started day one at the same time in the section, right? Yes. And you were a brand new section chief. Brand new section chief, never ran a section before. <clears throat> yeah. So me and John had a lot of interactions where he kind of looked to me for my experience, but I'll tell you what, John, uh, I was kind of, grown in a healthy leadership environment when I was a fresh section chief, I can't fucking imagine um, that section or that unit we were in when you were a brand new section chief. I can't imagine growing in that section. And I think it really kind of re reverberates through your, your section chief career or your time in the section. If you've yeah, kind I mean, of been I, grown in a toxic environment. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a after you left, it was, there was no shelter. I, I was pretty much, <laughs> on my own trying to trying to filter what we could from leadership because it was bad you know after the morning meeting we, we already knew like hey what was going to come down so it was a lot of like i said you see the bad section chiefs where they would hey chief wants this chief wants that chief wants this you know i chose me personally tried to filter most of the bullshit out you know only brief what was pertinent information what they needed to know and then kind of left that up left that up for, for me to answer to if they ever ask questions. You know, Kenny, you were in similar environments as me because you were my assistant section chief in the three ways when we had that stronger leadership team. And then you were uh, an assistant section chief. And I think eventually the primary section chief um, at Holloman when the leadership team was not as strong. What was your experience? Horrible. <laughs> 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 not literally like you, you don't I feel like sometimes you just didn't know what to do like I guess fight whatever battles you can fight and the rest of them you just get to that's how I that's why I started how I started <laughs> it's like I got fucking like, making this shit up like yeah because I mean like um I think it got worse later when the last guy that came in there before I exited out and he had just no idea how to do anything. Are you talking about the guy that had the, the museum in his office of his fucking accolades? Like he had Probably. the I love he, he had like a velvet rope he had to like cross <laughs> to get in his office. And he didn't know shit about shit. It was the most like the most obvious physical representation of the Dunning Kruger effect I had ever seen in my entire life, where he had all these accolades, but he was dumb as fuck. And he was so far out of the realm of maintenance for so long like you couldn't go to him for anything like yeah. hey what do you think about this well i don't know i don't know like you said i don't know this airplane so i don't know what to do so it's horrible so uh i've been i've been uh kind of texted back and forth with drew um the last few days just kind of brainstorming and stuff um but it seemed to me in my career, and I don't think it's a unique experience, that the section was always a, a launching pad for the, a production gig, a pro super gig, and eventually a lead pro super gig. And it seemed the better the 
section chief was in the section, the quicker they wanted to pull them out of the section to get them into production and start making money for production. Um, so it's almost like there's no continuity in the section for the guys, for the supervision, for the programs, for the processes, and just literally the person to fucking talk to when you got a problem. I mean, is that a unique experience for me? That is absolutely not. Section chiefs, they're only in the section about a year, maybe. Mm. Unless you don't have your CCAF and you're not promotable and then they keep you there forever. <laughs> because, man, I'll tell you what, like when I was a super, when I was a lead super, I would frequently go to that speech clip that I took and I would really fucking rely on that speech clip to get the mission done. So I could really see how a CCAF <laughs> is a fucking critical thing to have yes. to be a super. <laughs> right? Hey, Kenny? I, I, like I'm so fucking stubborn, <laughs> but it's kind of keeping me where I want to be. So like Chris, you, you know, you were lead pro super and then went back to section chief it, right? Uh, like no, by, by that's choice not accurate. Almost? I went from lead pro super to EOR super. EOR. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a retaliation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, but I went from a pro super back to a section chief when I asked to be in the in the spec section. Yes, yeah, and that was unheard of. Like it, literally, it? The, literally the conversation. Well, <laughs> my my whole career looked like a cardiac rhythm between like duty duty positions. But the the way that conversation happened was is my AMU chief pulled me in and said, "Hey, I want you to start getting spun up on lead super because I want you to be the next lead super." I said. Not only do I not want to be lead super, I don't want to be a pro super anymore. I want to be a section chief. And he looked at me like I had absolutely fucking lost my mind. Because in my experience, uh, careerists, and I'm going, to use, I'm going to use that broadly, and I'll probably unpack that a little bit later. Careerists can't understand why somebody wouldn't only be focused on being promoted. If, they, if, they, if the calculus does not exist in their brain, why somebody would walk away from a promotable position to a non-promotable position. And I don't even, I can't even, I can't even begin to articulate how stupid it is that pro super is a promotable con, pr position and section chief is not. Because the level of responsibility for a section chief, in my experience, is, is, is about the same as a pro super. A pro super, they don't have to worry about, you know, family issues, PT. They don't have to worry about any of that shit. It's, it's almost algebraic. The jet broke for this. This is the, the people that have are no emotions. No, like, yeah, it, it's, they can be finicky. And, you know, maybe you try that JFS cocktail and then you try the JFS <laughs> cocktail again. And then you try the JFS cocktail again. And then, oh, now we got to start working on it. But, um, you know, it's algebraic of light in the gear handle. You're going to go to this. If you have no starts, you're going to go to this. You have an ADG. You need to hold it down there for this long. It's, it's not super complicated. You're not being called because your guys at the emergency room. You're not being called because their, their kid was out wandering base housing. You're not getting any of those things. And I think it's, I think the air force is robbing. They're robbing themselves of, of legitimate leaders by not, treating the section chief as a promotable position. Some of those sections, you know, in our heyday, Kenny, how many fucking crew chiefs do we have way back in the heyday when the Air Force was, like, super bloated? I think we had, like, 110 crew chiefs in this section. You remember that? You were there, Oh, Drew. 308, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking about you're, they're managing 110 different people, all the training, all the upgrade programs, <laughs> aircraft assignments, family issues, you know, leave, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I know it's, I know the people that don't know me that are kind of listening to this are like, that guy is just fucking a, has a hard on for being a section chief. It's probably <laughs> true. That's a fair, that's a fair <laughs> assessment of me. Um, but, uh, you know, running mm -hmm. the section, it, it teaches some really valuable leadership qualities too. And, one of the biggest takeaways I had from running a section was I would see, and I certainly saw it when I was a young airman and I saw it, you know, other, how other sections were run where a guy comes in and something happened, you know, whatever it is, his life emergency and the section chief rolls their eyes, you know, they fucking shoot an email or did you tell the shirt and they act as if 
this dude, whatever the situation was, has has personally hurt the section chief. You've created more work. You've done this stupid thing. People are going to do stupid shit all the time. I knew section chiefs that did stupid things. I was a section chief. I did stupid things, right? Like that's not a unique experience or something you can, uh, you, uh, you know, vaccinate yourself against the stupidity for Christ's sake. We all know stupidity is, is a very fluid sort of uh, thing. But a good section chief will recognize that literally their job is the person's problem. So when they bring you a problem, you don't, you don't, treat them like crap because they have a life you don't treat them like crap because their family had an issue you recognize that they're bringing it to you because you are there your job is to help them and to fix it so their problem is now your problem and you need to work it like it's your problem instead of treating them like shit for bringing it to you oh man i feel guilty what are you talking about me chris <laughs> <laughs> so like recently that kind of came up and like i didn't I, it was like I wasn't a blind spot and that doesn't happen often. So like I'm super empathetic anyway. So like being a section chief is just emotionally draining yeah. to me because their problems are my problems. And, like, and rewarding, I, I imagine too. Right. Yep. Every single day. Yep. So recently, one of my, well, not in the past couple of years, one of my dudes came into like, I didn't even know this, like he felt this way. So like we were getting ready for a TDY. And like, I had to pick people, we had to pick people. And this was like a solid dude. And I picked him for the TDY and he came into the office. He was like, Hey, so far, I, I don't want to go on this TDY. Hold up. Hold up just a second. So just realize that people in your unit might be watching this. So That's I fine. just need, I just need you to be as vague as possible. I, okay. I'm sorry. Perfectly. Okay. And just making so sure. He, sorry. Uh, I was like, well, give me a reason. What, why, why? And, and he said he was tired. And I was mm. like, I did exactly what you said. You rolled my eyes and said, that's not a fucking reason. Like, <laughs> that's a I mean? pretty legit like, reason, like, isn't it? <laughs> and like, that's one of my, my big regrets of you know, being yeah. a section chief is like not realizing that and latching onto that and like, like, why? Like, yeah. Tell me about it. Let me let me fix it. Yep. But you know, I think part of that is because I I think section chiefs are beyond task saturated. So what happens is is your guy comes in and like I kind of explained in the beginning, I love Mondays because I didn't have all the weeks worth of shit piled up on my plate and which is why I hated Fridays. Your guy comes in, and if that's all you had, it, or if you were resourced appropriately where you had a, another section chief or an assistant or, or what have you, where you could take the day's task and just hand it to them and go, okay, let's go to airman family readiness. Let's go to mental health. I can drop everything because I, my job is to take care of you. So while you you know, you know, kind of express it's a regret, there's probably some guilt going on there. You know, I'm not trying to let you off the hook, but the reality is my guess is you had about 100,000 things to do that day. When that guy came in, you recognized that that was something that required you to kind of address. Yeah, and it it's uh, words matter too. Yeah. <laughs> I think I said something mean. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. You know, and, and there will be people watching this that um, I was a section, section chief for. And, and by the way, I certainly was not fucking God's gift to section chiefs. I had made not mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Not so, just playing, just playing. Um, you know. That's not what you said. That's not what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was too, I, 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 sometimes I would discipline and punish too hard. I would focus on things that were not the, I mean, especially when I was a brand new section chief in the 308, especially when we started getting thin, there would be times where it was focusing on the thing that wasn't most important. Um, you know, uh, and I think I beat up guys that didn't need to get beat up. And certainly in my time in the 311th, and John can attest to this, my behavior as a pro super was so evil that when I came into the section, a lot of people were afraid to come up to me. There would be people that kind of figured me out. Oh, I get him. I understand. He's, you know, this is how he is. We'll take care of us. But there was other people that would 
sooner drive home drunk than call me and, or would have an issue and they would seek out another section chief or somebody else altogether. And I'll tell you what, if you're a section chief and your people don't feel comfortable calling you for a ride when they're drunk or they're not willing to talk to you, that's an, that's an absolute failure. And I had probably dozens of people that, that were, were not comfortable calling me. Approachability uh, is yeah. key. Like you have to be approachable to be a yeah. good section chief. And like, okay. it's harder for the, it's harder for the assholes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it goes back to that. What was that Colin Powell quote? Um, the, the day your people stopped coming to you, it's because they either decided you don't care, you're not capable of taking care of them or something to that effect. Yeah. Right. You know, I definitely experienced that where people thought that I wasn't operating in their best interest. Cause part of what, part of it, what you're doing as a section chief is you can't broadcast it to the A1C that you told the chief to get fucked in a private conversation and you weren't going to do his stupid thing and you risk your career. They don't see that. And it's not appropriate for you to come back and be like, Oh, look what I did. I, I, you know, all these things. Um, but uh, I think there are ways you can kind of express that. Uh, when me and Kenny were um, at Luke, we had like, what, like three seven levels at oh, one time, rough. Kenny? Yeah. You know, and it was me, <laughs> Kenny, and two other section chiefs. And uh, Kenny, I will love forever. He was my guy, and uh, I brought him into the office, and he, Kenny is an absolute workhorse. And he was always getting shit done that I didn't even know needed to be done or stuff that I thought I was supposed to be doing. He was already doing. Um, but when we had three seven levels and you're talking about weekend duty, you're talking about every third weekend, the seven level has a weekend duty. And it was like, I couldn't imagine that as a seven level. And never mind the fact that they're working, you know, twelves forever. Um, and that's kind of my air force story. It like exactly what you're saying right now is my air force story. I was, one of three seven levels at Seymour for about eight months and it just broke me. So yep, like it's, it's what, it, what turned me not into a careerist. Like I yep. had to chop stuff out of my air force career mm. to keep my sanity. Yep. So I just stopped giving a fuck about getting promoted, like literally getting promoted. It's liberating Most, too. It's so liberating. <laughs> like, I would kind of giggle when the, the promotion cycle would come around and, like, people were like, oh, I studied 17 hours a day for 47 weeks. Like, I really? I like, just told the chief he was an idiot sucks. and I wasn't going to do a stupid <laughs> shit. And you're fucking worried about the promotion release? <laughs> it is super freeing. It is. But, yeah, so. I'm either really lucky or really smart that I'm a senior NCO. <laughs> Well, you Probably made it. Be you made it before there was uh, mass certain boards, right? Uh, I did, and yeah. then it was the last year that I could have, where they still had time and grade. Oh this yeah, that I was kind of fucking banking on to make <laughs> master sergeant. <laughs> yeah. So you failed your way to master. Good job. I did. I sure did. <laughs> but the, uh, the most I've studied for WAPS test is about an hour and a half, two hours, just because I had a, a really good chief that kind of pushed me towards it. But that was it. Yeah. So when me and Kenny were section chiefs, when we had those three, uh, seven levels, at some point I realized, like, if I was in their position, this would be, you know, terrible. So I think I talked to Kenny because we were, I know we were on the same shift and we came up with the plan where we were all, all the section chiefs placed ourselves on weekend duty as the, as, as the seven level. So basically we, we had four of us. There was two, two masters and two, um, uh, techs in the office. We all had red X's. I was like, fuck mm -hmm. it. Just put them on the schedule. Uh, I mean, you just went from every third weekend to basically once every two months. Like, just adding that breathing room was probably huge. Uh, and it, do you remember how the other section chiefs took to that, Kitty? When I told him, yeah, I told him I put him on. <laughs> I told him I put him on weekend duty as a seven level. And the master about fucking flipped his lid. <laughs> and said, how dare you? I'm like, do you have fucking red X's? Yes. All right. Well, we'll line it up. So when you're weekend duty super, you're all, that's also going to be I your weekend duty red X weekend. <laughs> you're already going to fucking be there. I'm not giving you any extra time. But, you know, there's people that are – that feel like – I think there's a lot of section chiefs that feel like when they graduate off the line that they never have to sign off a red X again. And 
that that you know that pressure and that stress of doing it is gone. And I think that's the difference between you know a crew chief. I'd cut my hand off if I could go push a box again. Well, I did it. You know, I did it until the day, pretty much the day I retired. Especially when I was EOR super. I mean, I was really enforcing some some great TO standards down there at EOR for the for the fleet. So you're welcome, uh, Holloman. But um, you know, and that well, and, made and the aircraft better it, eventually. It did, it did something, uh, but um, <laughs> we didn't have any more fuel leaks anymore. Um, but you know, it's stuff like that. Basically recognizing, you know, and I, when I was a young staff, senior airman staff sergeant, whatever on swing shift, I would get so fucking frustrated where my section chiefs weren't. It's like they have all the fucking stripes. What are they doing? What are they doing to make my life and my job easier? And what I kind of realized is they weren't, I mean, there was a few like Ricky Radford was like the god of flight chiefs, but there was a few that were like, I, I, I kind of realized they weren't going to do anything for me because to do something for me would somehow detract from their promotability or they were brand new to the section because nobody stayed in the section the amount of time. And I really kind of promised myself that if I became a section chief, I would use my, you know, my power and authority to affect real change on the flight line. And that was part of what that placing us all on, on weekend duty was. It was kind of free up time for the guys. Those ideas are hard too. Like yeah. You can't, like, you have to seek that stuff out and find what, what am I going to do to yeah. lighten the load or. And a lot of it has to do with something. It, it takes sacrifice, right? And that's really what, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of beating around the bush, but that's really what a servant leader is, right? Like I work for my people and I will do, I will take care of them to the best of my ability. I use all the resources at my disposal to do right by them. And, and by doing that, it, it will reciprocate. They will perform better. They will do better and it will make my job easier. That's literally how servant leadership works. So, uh, I guess when it comes to, you know, you know, we're talking broad leadership kind of, um, topics, but the problem is 90% of what you do in a section isn't what we're talking about, is it? So what is 90% of your day kind of occupied with? Microsoft Excel. Yep. <laughs> Slides. <laughs> Slides. 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 1206s. Slides, 1206s, EPRs, um, you know, training, Kenny, right? Like you lived the training piece for a while. Yeah, that was consuming. You know, and it, it, it's, it's, it's almost like you need to do all these things to tell people how your section's doing instead of actually running your section, Right. Like you spend all of your time figuring out how to report what the fuck's going on instead of actually doing what needs to be done. Like if you didn't have to fucking update a billion fucking slides and, and Excel spreadsheets and all these things to report how your section's doing terribly, you could actually like work on making your section better, right? And here's a, uh, uh, a Chris, um, 20 years done, uh, section sheet pro tip, uh, they only see colors on slides. They don't see the data. So just start changing all your colors to green and they won't fucking <laughs> notice that the numbers are bad. Everybody's laughing because they know it it's is hundred percent fucking true. <laughs> <laughs> so goddamn ridiculous. Like the Taliban would win if they fucking crashed Excel. <laughs> so, um, you know, it seemed to me that in my experience as both a section chief and a pro super is the section chief was responsible for the quality of the maintenance performed and, you know, disciplining the guys and the pro super was only responsible for the producing the sorties, eight hour fix rate, all the kind of metrics that went into that, which meant that the production office was a lot less concerned with the quality and much more concerned with the quantity. Whereas, 
you know, the section chief was was always focused on quality because they had to answer for all those, which to me seemed uh, stupid because production is out there all day, every day. They see, they know when something was done correctly. They know when something was done too fast. They know how many resources they have. So I guess the question is, why was the section chief responsible for the quality and why wasn't production responsible? Why isn't, why isn't production responsible for the quality of the maintenance? Because nobody cares about passes. Mm. So that's kind of my mantra and I say it like half sarcastically, but have to bring it to the attention of everyone that there's people that care about passes. So the, the production side of nobody cares about passes is they're making the numbers doesn't matter how shitty the maintenance is. Mm. They're getting the quantity. Quality be damned. Uh, yeah. It, that doesn't that doesn't seem healthy. It it's not, and I'm not saying that that's happening here, but just generally. Right. I know we're talking broadly. I get it. I get it. Uh I never really realized that until you said it. Like, how come the production section doesn't care about the quality of maintenance? <laughs> they don't have to. They don't have to speak to it. We're the section chiefs are the ones that usually have to answer for for the work. So all they care about, like Chris said, is produce produce for me, and let the section chiefs worry about the heat. You know. Worry about the throttle grip fails. Worry about the UCRs yeah. and all that, because it's our people that we got to answer for and try to figure out how to jump through hoops for. So that makes it a reactionary thing, right? If the section chief is responsible for the quality, but the section chief isn't out there while the maintenance is being performed, how does the section chief address a quality issue when there's a failure and there's a quality uh, deficiency identified? They can't be proactive. It's only reactive, right? And reaction is desert, which we covered, or <laughs> discipline punishment, right? Right. Yes. Or they do the section chiefs need to be out on the line, right? Stripes on the line, yep. Who has time for that? Raise your hand. I need to put my hand down, right? <laughs> Who has fucking time for that? <laughs> it's it's like it's it's the old like it, it, it's almost like I just ima as a section chief it's almost like I imagine a, a dam is breaking I actually got this analogy from Chief Roberts God, God rest his soul but it's almost like you know a dam is breaking and there's all these little leaks kind of and you're just literally sticking fingers and fucking toes and your nose just trying to hold back you know this flood and so you know pro supers are kind of locked into their eight hour shifts which when I was a section chief you know um Actually, at Holloman, I worked eight hours because I was like, fuck this place. Um, but when I was at Luke, Kenny, you remember the hours we were pulling at Luke as a section chief? It was 15 hours a day plus weekends. Yeah, just like you're working on a lot again. Yeah. Yep. You know, um, and that was because it was just putting fingers in holes. And, you know, very rarely would you see AMU leadership walk into the pro super and be like, hey, I have a project for you. That literally didn't fucking happen. But... <laughs> the section chief was always the person that was getting a project and it, there never seemed to be much consideration for, you know, all the other things going on. And it, to me, it really speaks to, I think section chiefs are undervalued in a unit. I think a lot of unit leadership don't recognize if, if you have a good section chief in the office and it's longer than, you know, six months, just long enough for them to get the EPR and skedaddle where they can really build programs. They can build a relationship with the guys they can learn the fucking job, right? Like get a, either a legitimate turnover or they get enough time in the seat where they can learn it. If you get a section chief that's in there for a year, year and a half, two years, and the programs start humming where he doesn't have to fucking do this, where the manning is kind of figured out, or at least they can foresee shit happening. The training is all streamlined and smooth. Like it's, it's really hard to quantify that sort of, that 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 environment but you know that 
because that, that frees up the section chief to start having the conversation with the guys. They can do stripes on the line. I don't mean stripes on the line because you fucking, you know, I got to be out there from 3 to 3.30. Da, da, da. <laughs> like, fuck that. Like, when I was a pro super, every single night after I did, you know, prepare the schedule, I would walk the entire line. I would go from jet to jet, and I would talk to all the people, ask what was going on with the jet. And then I would also ask, you know, hey, what's going on? And I joke around with them and, you know, whatever. Like that's spending time with your people. Like I think I think some, you know, rich guy or motivational speaker like called it walk about leadership or something. Like everybody's going to coin a phrase for, for what it is. But like that shouldn't be an instruction. Like you need to walk about to be a leader. Like you, you need yeah. to be told you got to fucking go and walk and interact with the people working for you. If you need to be told – you're a fucked and you shouldn't be a leader anyway because that's not an instructional video sort of concept. So um, a lot of that I'm chained to my desk or I don't have time is internal too. I can stand my happy ass up and walk out to the flight line. That's true. Whatever the fuck I want to. <laughs> it's just what are you sacrificing in lieu of, right? Right. And it's and usually my, my time I still have to do what I was doing. Or something that wasn't as important as they all made it seem to be. And if it's not caught – who cares? Right. That's also a piece too, right? Like part of being a section chief is recognizing you have a thousand things to do. And they, even though they want you to do a thousand things going, I kind of don't give a fuck about this and I don't give a fuck about this. And there's not, there is not a situation I foresee where I've cleared my plate enough to address this. And they're not going to fucking ask about it anyway. Well, I'm not going to do it. But you pick six of those and then do them all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Or, hey, also, uh, 20 years done, section chief pro tip number two, if you update the date on the slide without updating the slide, that'll get you through a week of whatever the fuck that slide is, too. (laughs) It's fucking true. (laughs) I'm just going to turn all the slides green, just completely green with just the date that just auto updates with the day that it is. I, I did that. I did the auto update thing. But, no, set the date to, like, January 1st, 2022, like, after your retirement day. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, shit's green till fucking next year. We're good. <laughs> yeah, that's how our Air Force fly fights and wins. Fucking dates on slides. Never mind the fact that a lot of people don't know it, but if the slide is updated but the date isn't, that is as, bo- as bad as if the slide wasn't fucking updated. And you need to think <laughs> about how stupid that statement I said is, and it's still fucking true. The information is correct, but... <laughs> This is not today. Because that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the biggest problem, right? Like, I don't know if anybody else. I know John's knows this because we we work, work together. Probably Kenny too. People are afraid of questions in meetings. Anybody else notice that? Yep. Like, I just don't want to have any questions. <laughs> why? <laughs> that that stupidity you just said made me ask a question of why. Why the fuck are? Why, why don't you want questions? Like, people get so obsessed with heading off any potential question that they spend so much time preparing for every inevitability. Yeah. You'll study and prep and get all your ducks in a row. And then you'll get asked a question that you didn't even think of anyways. There was, and I, and I'm, I'm fortunate I'm going to have to dip my toe back into the production meeting. When I took over lead super in the three fourteenth, when I went from support section chief to lead super, which is a, a bit of a strange path. And then of course I went to EOR super thereafter. Um, but uh, my mid shift super would have to print out every single FI for every single pilot reported discrepancy, the entire fault tree, highlight the path they took, and and be able to explain the theory of operation, why the guys changed what they did, and run a history on the part, not just at this station, but it was over what was, was ever that that weird database was where it would say that this is what discrepancy the part had at Shaw Air Force Base in 2014, and if it's the same fault, then why the fuck did we put it in the jet? Like she, I asked her one time, how long do you spend preparing for the morning meeting? And she said, I spend more than 50% of my shift printing things out and trying to be ready for any questions. And then I told the, the, the AMU OIC, I said, she's not fucking doing that anymore because that means she's not being a pro super for half of her shift. He's like, well, she doesn't need to do all that because we only ask one question. I'm like, you don't get it. She has to prepare for every question. Even if you ask one question, if it's not, if that's the one question she didn't fucking prepare for, you guys are going to treat her like she's the most, you know, the giant piece of shit because she didn't have that answer. So she has to spend all of this time and energy just making a question. And my dog. Okay. 
Okay, I digress. Go. So, you know, the, the fear of questions and trying to, trying to anticipate every single question, I think that's a problem too. Like you should be able to go to meetings with a general idea what the fuck's going on in your section, a general idea of what's going on in the programs or thing coming up. You know, you kind of look at the slides, but at some yeah. point it should be okay to say, I don't know. Uh, and it's not, not, not <laughs> specific to production either. Like that's no. uh, the same for section chiefs, just QA fails. Yeah. And expected to know the day, the day after. So you get a swing, a swing shift fail at four o'clock in the morning. Well, mm. What happened? I don't know. That was three hours ago. You know, I'm sure there weren't two horrible human beings existing at the same time that thought up the root cause analysis sheet independent <laughs> of each other. There was probably one cockbag who fucking created that monster, and it's just evolved for like the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. But the root cause analysis doesn't actually get to the root cause. Like as a section chief, a lot of people don't want to hear what the root cause is because a lot of times the root cause is they didn't have enough time, they didn't have enough people, they didn't have enough resources, not enough experience. You know, they're fucking tired. They're Blind near people. blowing their – they, they, they went home yesterday and contemplated blowing their brains out, so it turns out they don't give a fuck about the spin, spin stop pads being worn too much and their fucking nose landing gear. You know, whatever it might be. So what really happens with the root cause analysis sheet is you dig down just enough to make them not fucking – ask any more questions anymore and at which point you're not reaching the root cause you're not fixing the problem and it's just uh an appeasement right i just <clears throat> remember the times where i'd kick it up to leadership and they'd be like oh uh, you're not gonna put that on there I'm like yeah. that's what happened <laughs> and it's the truth right you're not gonna put the truth on here yep you're not gonna put it it's on there it just doesn't sound good <laughs> yeah it doesn't so for sound some good. i've done some I've done, like, they really surprise me, and I'm like, well, shit, I didn't even expect that. But typically, it's a gigantic, ginormic waste of time. Yeah. No, I agree. No, I mean, and there, if it was an informal process where you just pulled your guy aside and be like, hey, man, what the fuck happened? You know, that's a different thing altogether because that's your chance to see the humanity. And never mind the fact that we're fucking human beings. And I don't know if you've ever done it, but can the root cause be because he's not a robot? He's a human being and he's, 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 he, there's a capacity for error, mistakes, exhaustion, you know, all these issues. Has anybody ever put that on an RCA that he's human and <laughs> shit happens? Not, not that has he got kicked back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was one for a, a, a individual getting caught with a cell phone on the flight line, and the individual said, "I fucked up." So I yeah. kind of put it in there. The individual was, he had his phone. He knows he's not supposed to have it out there. He just messed up. Is that when <laughs> they, they didn't put, like that answer? Is that when they, the solution was to put all the signs all over the building saying, "Don't take your cell phone on the?" I'm pretty line. sure. Yeah, yes. that makes that adds up. That adds up. Because <laughs> that's gonna stop. <laughs> You know, it's like, again, you know, you're trying to anticipate everything and you spend so much of your time and all that, a lot of that time's wasted because you anticipated one outcome and it didn't happen. You know, you're just chasing what ifs and possibilities because you're, you know, no one's willing to accept a, I don't know, which is really backwards because, you know, the conversation we just had about quality by its nature is always going to be reactionary because you can't be out there and see what's going on. Yeah. Here's the ones I hate. I hate the ones where you, you do your root cause analysis and you nail it down and here's the, going to be my fix to this problem. And then the next day we fail for the same exact shit. Yeah. And then two yeah, days later, gonna... the same shit. And then two days after that, it's the same shit again. And then like everybody's losing their minds. So like you're like putting processes and like adding and adding and adding shit to, well, well now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do this. And I'll be bringing it up in the AMU leadership conversation, but it almost, almost makes me think it's because the group, you know, you know, I don't know this for a fact because I was a young airman and I'm sure I was dumb and oblivious, but I'm pretty sure like in the late nineties, early two thousands, the group commander didn't ask for all the details of every single fucking QA fail that ever happened. 
I think quarterly when the stats came out, and if they were low, they were like, hey, you need to fucking focus on your QA stats. You kind of suck at it. And that was it. I don't think there was daily briefings with all the details, the root cause analysis, you know. And it's like if, if you had a situation you were talking about, Drew, where it's, it happened today and it happened tomorrow, that could very well just be a – you know, what caused it was kind of a, a norm and how you guys had a process before and people aren't caught up to a new change to kind of prevent the, the fails from happening. It could be the guy was out sick that day and didn't hear about it. There could be a myriad of other issues. Never mind the fact that how often do we see QA piling on when there's one fail and all the QA guys huddle around like little Jawas and figure out that, oh shit, that's a fucking fail? And then they all go out and fucking look for it, you know, because that's the new flavor of the week for QA fails. And you haven't had a chance uh, enough to react to it. You are going to say something, Drew? Go ahead. Uh, I don't fucking remember. Sorry. <laughs> I, <should laughs> shut up. I really wanted to slip that Jawas joke in there. It was a fucking good one. Oh, um, so... You know, we kind of talked about a few. Did anybody have any other, like, egregious fails as a section chief? I got a few more that I can talk about where I was a horrible section chief. But if anybody has anything else. Go ahead. Let's hear, so, let's hear yours. <laughs> um, I had – oh, God, this, this is – it still bothers me. I had a guy – or I had – Kenny, you're, you'll, you'll remember this one. We had someone draw a dick on oh. uh, a whiteboard. And yeah. it was underneath our Manning, right? So, like, I'm sitting at the desk looking down the, the office at where the board is, but our Manning is, like, literally draped over the dick, so I didn't see it. Um, and we had a female assistant OIC come in and, like, lift up the paper and look, and there was a dick there, right? So, um, you know, me and Kenny kind of got together, and we played uh, True Detectives to figure out, okay – when did the Manning go up? We would have seen it then. Here's the window of opportunity for this to happen. And we pretty much, you know, I came to the conclusion that it happened. Did you do on... handwriting samples? You should have no. made everybody draw a dick. No. Get the whole fucking section in there. Draw well, me a dick. Like, yeah, you know, don't tell I them didn't. what's happening and then just match the dicks to the I'm drawn pr- dicks behind the I'm pretty you sure like, hold it up and like I'm pretty sure they wouldn't even put me at EOR Super uh, after that. Um <laughs> You will draw a dick. Yeah, like that's definitely. Uh, I'm calling my congressman. They're fucking making me draw dicks. Um, but I had, I had figured out it was swing shift, and I went into swing shift roll call, and I, it was a full blown dress down about how they were. You know, and it was almost targeted at the NCOs about how it happened on their ship. Never mind the. Okay, so let me let me shelve the story real quick. Drawing a dick on a whiteboard isn't a, f- a fucking huge deal anyway, right? Like, we all kind of like, oh, shit, you know, you're female. Like, you should be able to have a dick drawn on a board underneath a piece of paper, and when the LT walks in and be like, hey, Chris, there's a dick drawn on your board. What am I going to do with it? Oh, there's a fucking eraser right there. I'll brief the guys. That literally should have been the end of it. And I don't know if it's because we were not – I think that was right after some other stuff was going on. We were in a heightened state of, uh, of stuff. Um but I went into that swing shift roll call and I gave them, you know, I mean, for, for the people that have uh, experienced one of my counseling sessions, it can be um, energetic, but uh, I, I get, I, it was the whole, it was the whole show. And I was so certain that it happened on their shift. And then the next day I called in one of my guys that was on profile to try to find out if he knew anything and he literally said, well, I, I drew the dick. And he was on day shift. Um, and, I, and you know, you know, when you choose somebody's ass, especially when you're skilled at it, it can, it can, you, can, you can push some personal buttons. You can you know, question people's integrity, question their leadership, their supervisory skills, you know, point out if they're unworthy of leading the shift. These are all the things I pretty much brought up in that, in that ass chewing. Um, and as soon as that kid said that he had drawn it and I realized I had yelled at the wrong people, man, like you can't get that trust back. Even though nobody in that room knew, I knew 
that I had just yelled at a whole bunch of people. I hadn't done my fucking homework. And I mean, it was that, hard. That's huge. Like you have to, it's hard. Uh, like I have anger issues anyways that I've been dealing with forever. It's hard to hold yourself until you know exactly what's going on and then unleash hell. And, you know, I went into him that night at roll call and I explained what happened. I explained that I had, did not have all the information. I thought I did, but I didn't know. And I had said some things I regretted. Even in hindsight, if they had been the ones that were on shift when this stuff happened, it still wasn't the right thing to say. Um, you know, that's the best I can do to admit where I had failed. But from then on, I did not chew anybody's ass unless I fucking knew every single way it could have happened. I would, I mean, Kenny and John both remember, I would go to the ends of the earth to find all the possible reasons why this person couldn't have done the thing that I thought they did, explore all the evidence, you know, rips from support, you know, where people were, ask people questions. And if I didn't know, I didn't fucking chew their ass. I just let them know that I think it was them. I'm keeping an eye on them. And that was kind of the end of it. And that was big from uh, chewing those guys' ass about that dick drawn on the board. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard lesson. And I think every section chief learns that, and they'll yell at the wrong person and then realize it and have to. So like the good ones, mm. eat, eat crow and apologize and say, I was fucking wrong. And some of them don't. Some of them don't. So don't be one of the people. Well, first of all, take the lesson that do your homework and know. But if you do yell at people and you're fucking wrong, you got to you got to apologize. You got to you got to make amends. You have to and learn from it. Like that's big. Well, they respect you more for that, though. That you admitted you were wrong. So. I don't know about more. They'll respect you more than previous, right? <laughs> but obviously, they'll get the most respect for you. They're like, fucking McGee, he always knows. He always knows what the fuck's going on. He catches everybody. He's, he's the all-knowing, all-seeing flight chief. That's what you want to be. <laughs> you want to be the guy. And that's also a bigger piece, too. And I explained that in, in roll calls. I, I kind of figured that out later. As a section chief, you want to be the scariest motherfucker to your people. You want to be the person that, like, I don't want to fucking – I don't want McGee to catch me. I don't. You don't want to be the guy that's like, oh, well, fucking, uh, yeah, I know that you pencil whipped it, but, you know, like, you don't want to be the person that's like, oh, you're going to go see the commander. The commander should not be the scariest person. The only thing the commander should be scary for is he's the person that has the authority to put your ass out of the Air Force, right? But your section chief, sh that you should be the one that people are either seeking your approval the most or they're afraid of your, of your discipline and punishment the most because then the buck stops at you. There's nobody higher that can influence your people. And that doesn't mean, you know, you, you, you know, you're, you're a monster, but it certainly means they know that if they, you know, violate obvious standards, especially when it comes to quality or safety, that you're going to be the person that's, that they're answering to. It goes back to that whole power thing, right? Of you don't want to be the person that's just a go between the lever of your AMU chief or whoever else is kind of actuating the, the section leadership. You're you're running your section. And that's where I find, you know, section chief to be I found the section chief to be a more rewarding job than pro super. Because when you get to become a section chief, that is your section. You get to you get to create the tone, you get to create, you know, the standard. You get to enforce the standard. You get to, you know, help people. You get to discipline people and correct them. Um, as a as a pro super, you know, as I was kind of talking to Drew the other day, you're just the, the glue between the jets and ops, and you're just trying to fucking bring them together and, and make sortie you're, babies. You're right? on a leash. You're just yeah. leashed up. So. Yep. But a good section chief, you are the authority of your section, just like a good – AMU chief is the, the, the authority of the, of the AM, you know, AM, uh, OIC in chief. Uh, that's how it should be. So really it's about an ownership thing. Take ownership of your section. And a lot of times that means tell, telling people to get the fuck out of your business. How, however you can phrase that and still stay a section chief. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that micromanagement is pervasive and the only way to stop micromanagement is to not micromanage. You're the buck stops with you. Um, 
just say, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and, and the reality is a lot of times when units are starved for resources, uh, you can't be fired as a section chief because there's nobody else that can really replace you. Like there's no fucking options. And it's important to recognize that. No. And like you said before, finding that balance between being the scariest motherfucker, the buck stops here and Hey, let me talk to you about this serious, serious thing that I have an issue with. That's like super personal and I don't yep. want anybody else to know about, but yep. you. And like I said before, I probably fucked that up. There was definitely some people that were in both the sections in um, at, at Luke and at Holloman that they weren't. They, I don't think they would ever, ever come to me. And that's a real failure as a section chief. If you have people in the section that won't come to you, I mean, I can, I can say that they didn't understand or they just weren't going to come to me anyway. But part of being a section chief, the job is to build that bridge with each member of your section, so that the way they feel comfortable crossing it and coming to you uh, if there's a problem. So, uh, I, to me, that that that's a critical piece uh, of being uh, a section chief. Yeah, and me personally, I'm just balanced the other direction. Like I have more of the more of the the personal relationship and less of the accountability when I should. That like I'm still trying to find that balance. You know what I mean? And we'll continue to try to find that balance. Yep. Yep. I mean, when I took over the section, when me and Kenny went to the section, the previous section chief, um, they used to call him the Easter Benny. Remember that, Kenny? Like, like an A1C walked in when I was in the office and said, hey, Easter Benny, can I get a day off tomorrow? And he was like, oh, yeah. God. And I'm like, did A1C <laughs> just call you a Master Sergeant Easter Benny and ask for something and then you gave it? Oh, like, no. That's way – the pendulum is way too far to the to the nice guy. I mean, that's yeah. good. I bet he had no problems with his guys coming to him at all whatsoever because he was Easter Benny. But, um, like, that's not good either. You don't want to be that guy because th there's not going to be any accountability. You guys are going to run wild. They're going to walk all over you. There's no – the power dynamic is totally fucked up. Um, but – I walked into that section at the time as a, as a bit of a disciplinarian because I, th I thought I needed to kind of straighten them up. And I think I, I think I hurt um, a lot of people for that. I didn't need to like, that's a, you know, and like Drew said, you're going to find the balance and the balance is going to be different for each individual as well. There's some people you can go up to and you can give them a lot of rope because you know that you can give them a lot of, of room to breathe because they, they have that. And there's other people you fucking watch like a hawk because you know that they aren't ethical and they, they will damage your section. They are toxic, you know, dealing with toxic people in your section to me, that, that was the hardest thing. And I don't, I don't even know if that was a failure or not um, because I might've been so gun shy from that ass chewing about the dick drawn on the board that I didn't handle toxicity later on because I didn't want to pull the trigger unless I was sure, unless I had proof that I could do it. Um, that might, that might have been a failure with the pendulum swinging the other way, kind of like what you're saying, Drew. Yeah, and that's why knowing your people is so important, too. So, like, not only specific to the leader, like, you have to know your people and know what you can – you have to know what motivates them and know like, how to speak to – like, literally how to speak to them Yep. to get what you want and what the Air Force wants. Yep. And what's, like – I don't know. It's hard to say what's best for them, but if they're fucking up, I mean, they need Yep. No, I, I mean, taking care of people sometimes mean an LOC, LOR, you know, putting them on weekend duty to kind of straighten them out, to let them know that, look, this behavior is just not acceptable. I want you to succeed. I told all my people, and I, I would I would imagine some of the ones that um, never trusted me, never believed me, but it's easier to rehabilitate any airman at any time in the service than it is to kick them out, wait for a backfill, and then roll the dice that that person is better because they may not be, right? Like I'd rather, I'd rather deal with a known person that's underperforming than kick them out and roll the dice for an unknown person to show up. I mean, because I've had people where they, replace, they backfilled somebody else. And I legitimately thought, John, you're going to remember this. I legitimately thought no one could be worse than this engine tech sergeant. And then the new oh. guy walks in and he's definitely worse. worse. And it's like, <laughs> how in the fuck is this possible? 
So it can always happen. Re rehabilitating and, and correcting it is, is important. Um, but, you know, and I think it takes... to see who's listening too. Like if you discipline somebody and they get it and they're yeah. trying to fix themselves, that is blatantly obvious. Yep. And it's just, uh, it makes it better through adversity anyways. Like they, if you've learned a lesson, you can teach that to somebody else and not no. have them go through the same shit. And, and, um, Oh, shoot, I don't know where I put my pen. And um, you know, it really, when it comes when it comes to discipline, it's all about ego. Like when the person is not willing to accept their responsibility for it. And I'm not trying to go back to our favorite squadron commander, John. But when you catch somebody and you caught them, like there's a certain and they they need to grow. They have to excuse me. They have to accept their role. They have to accept their responsibility and they're not going to fucking grow. Just like you said, Drew, they're not going to grow until they recognize what the deficiency was and kind of, and kind of go from there. A lot of times when you give somebody an LOC, LOR, they would do ego protecting stuff of fuck McGee, fuck, you know, whatever, you know, that's not, that's bullshit. I'm the best guy out here. Like, and they would do all these sort of posturing and ego protecting things. And like Drew said, you know, immediately they're not going to fucking get it. They're not going to change. They're not going to grow from this. They're not going to recognize what they did. Um, so for me, it was always big when you get the person that would, you know, I mean, it didn't happen very often, but they would come up and, and kind of thank you afterwards. Like, okay, I understand what you were doing here and I appreciate it. I didn't need that. That's big. That's how you. Well, that's how you know you're disciplined, right? If yeah. People come back to you and they they give you the feedback of, like, here's here's the lesson I learned. Like, that's powerful. No, that's a good point too, because you know, if they come back, yeah, you disciplined right, and sometimes they just may it might just be somebody that's never going to get it but also there's other ways to discipline people like it doesn't necessarily have to be an LOC LOR and that's where your chief needs to kind of give you the the latitude to run your section as you see fit um, and it might be you put them on the shitty program or or it might just be you sit them down and go hey what the fuck's going on oh my wife left me oh, okay yeah i don't need yeah. to pile an LOR here like that's not that's not appropriate. This will not be helpful. Yeah, like this is this is going to drive you to suicide. Like have that conversation, uh, and that's that. You know that goes back to the whole. If they're not willing to tell you, it very well could be that you didn't create an atmosphere where they wanted to come to you and tell you. You know, like that's big. Well, um, I did want to talk one more. Oh, I'm glad I remembered it too. I'll write it down just in case I get sidetracked. I want to talk about one more thing that's a little bit outside the section chief purview, at least on paper, but I think it's an important part of being a section chief. Um, and that's mentorship, right? And I think in the Air Force today, they have a really hard fucking time defining a mentor. Like, first of all, a mentor, mentee, or mentor, protege, whatever you want to call it, relationship, that should be organically built. It is not a where you go online and you, you go to a mentorship. I, I, I think they had it uh, towards the end of the Air Force. I had a buddy of mine like reach out to me over the Air Force portal be like, hey, I asked for you to be my mentor. Um, like where it's literally you pick their career field, where they've been at, what they're interested in, and it pairs you up with some asshole at another base. And now you're going to call him up and ask him to be your mentor. What if he's an immoral cockbag? Like that's not – that's not going to be – does that say that on the portal? Uh, yeah, he has this duty station, he's got this that duty box title, check. but he's an <laughs> <a> immoral <laughs> cockbag. Like, it doesn't fucking say that. You're not going to know that, right? Um, you know, I had I had quite a few mentors in, in, in my uh, career, and a lot of them came from working for them, recognizing who would never ask me to do something unethical, who we had a value alignment or ethics alignment. Um, but – in the Air Force, now they have speed mentoring where people go to the club and there's like 17 staff sergeants, tech sergeants, and master sergeants sitting down at tables. And a bunch of airmen come in and sit down for five minutes and just cycle through the room and get advice. Sure. I think that, yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> put on my stupid old retired guy hat. That happened in 2017 at a few bases. I would like to think that it fucking died an early death and nobody kept doing that. But I don't have a lot of faith in that because really what it ended up being is an airman would sit down and go, how can I get promoted? 
And I'm telling you right now, if your concept of what a mentor is, is somebody that can teach you how to get promoted, you're fucked. That's not a mentor. A mentor is there to demonstrate how to behave, how to become a technical expert, how to be a leader. And all of those kind of life lessons you're going to get from that person will eventually hopefully translate into promotion. But very often mentorship is how do I study? How do I test? How do I get a must promote? Like you're chasing to get promoted. Start trying to get good at your fucking job. Yep. And it's really unfortunate that being good at your job seems to be semi divorced from getting promoted. Um, You know, there's many a time where we would sit down and, you know, write packages for air. I mean, I had an airman. God, he was a good, it was a, I'm going to use a name because it's all positive. Uh, Airman Accardi, such a sharp, sharp guy, really good worker, um, good work ethic. Um, he was, you know, I think he was an A1C or senior at the time, but he was like, he was, he was good, really good. And I wrote him a 1206 package as a section chief. We took it to the, to the AMU and he ended up getting selected over the other sections, but he didn't have enough volunteer work. And the senior came up to me and said, Hey, they're doing this, this weekend, tell a Cardi he needs to go to it. So that way we can get it on his 1206. And I don't know the exact words I used, but I pretty much said there is no fucking way I'm going to tell an airman who I have just said is great that they have just lost their weekend so they can do some bullshit volunteer work to prove that they're great. So that way I can put it on a 1206. Like Uh we are, it's absolutely flipping. It's, 100% 100% cart ahead of the horse as far as the Air Force is concerned where it's appearance over substance and everything else but like it's broken when that is your first thought not the outcome for growing the person and taking care of the person yep. what I tell them is you volunteer for what you're passionate about Yeah. don't, don't volunteer to put it on a 1206 that's bullshit you know, that's, that's uh, fake, and it will yeah. get you stuff that's not important. What's you know, important and, and is like is what you care about. And we're gonna definitely get a little bit off topic, but I'm okay with it. But two things, I'm gonna write it down so I don't forget. Two things. Um, you guys know that uh, Luke, I think two years ago, the base commander dictated a day of volunteering for the whole base, like on a Thursday. Everyone. Like, they were not allowed to work. They all had to, like, months before, pick their volunteer event. They were out picking up trash on the side of the road. They were out, you know, building homes. They were, you know, whatever. The Whatever the population of Luke Air Force Base was, it was fucking but all that, of But that's not what the word means. <laughs> well, I know. Never mind <laughs> the fact that now you've just, dec- you, you've just baselined everyone's volunteerism. The whole point – God bless. I fucking hate this shit. The whole point of having volunteerism on any sort of awards package and or performance report is because you're trying to see beyond their work. You're trying to see their character. You're trying to see the, their humanity. You're trying to, you're trying to quantify an intangible characteristic onto a piece of paper. That's what you're trying to do. But the problem is everybody knows it's a box to check. So all the fucking altruistic people, which, by the way, like Susan um, Murdoch, Susan Smith, if, 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 like she volunteered because she loved to volunteer. I mean, she's not dead. I shouldn't use the past tense. I'm sure she still likes to volunteer. But she volunteers because she loves to volunteer. Every fucking weekend she was doing something. It is in her character to give to other people. That's what that – box that's what that section on the performance report the 1206 and everything else that's what it's for you're trying to capture that but the problem is all the box checking careers fucks know that that's necessary for it so they all do whatever easiest bullshit volunteering there might be to get the box checked and when luke air force base decides that everybody fucking volunteers on the same day you've just made your altruistic good people equivalent 
to your careerist piece of shit people. And now on paper, you fucking can't tell the difference between who's a lying piece of shit that doesn't care about people and who's the person that gives it their time all the time. Like, that's stupid. And I can't believe they did it. And I can't believe volunteerism is a, a quantifiable metric for promotion. Uh, again, a testament to to knowing your people and know who's doing that and knowing for which reason. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, I just – I'm going to shut up for a little bit because I'm a little bit poopy. So if anybody else wants to uh, – they have anything they want to bring up, the volunteers and bothers me. <laughs> Other failures. Come on. Um, you know what? I'll talk about. I, I mean, I'm I'm getting a little tired of talking, but I'll talk about one more failure, John. Um, and anybody that hasn't read the totality of my blog at this point, you're probably going to be a little bit um, lost on what this is about. But you know, I got fired. Although I didn't really get fired, but I got fired from being a section chief, um, a spec section chief in the 311th. Uh, I got moved to support. The support section chief got moved in. Um, I suspect it's because I was difficult on all the things I thought were immoral or um, things I didn't agree with. And I vocalized it to the commander at the time when I thought he was wrong and everybody in the room was aghast that I would have the, you know, audacity to tell another human being that they were, their biases were influencing their decisions. Fuck. Right. Um, and when, you know, when I got moved out of the section and kind of what you talked about before, John, where I moved out, the other guy moved in, you know, I'm not necessarily going to disparage him, but he was very focused on his career. And I think when you are focused on your career, you, when at some point as a section chief or even as a leader, you're going to have to pick between your people and your career. You're going to find a time where it might cost your career to take care of your people. And in my experience, it happens actually probably quite a bit. Um, and he was the type of person that would pick his career, which kind of left you all alone to kind of fight the fight the best you could. And so my failure there was, I wonder if my aggression with disagreeing with squadron and AMU leadership is what got me moved out of that section because they wanted somebody that was less difficult. So that to me, it felt like every single time the guys were getting fucked thereafter, the failure was I fought too hard before, got fired out, and now I was no longer in a position to protect those people. So, like, it's important to fight, but you also need to recognize that if you fight, if you're very zealous in your fight, there's a, there's a chance you won't be able to fight anymore. And then you have to so, think about all the people that you can't protect anymore. I really, really hate the adage, pick pick your battles. Because mm. I'm like you, Chris. Like, I'll fight every fucking battle. I'll, I'll fight every single one of them. <laughs> but, but you're right. It puts you – it kind of pigeon you, pigeonholes you into, well, now you're not in that position anymore because you're so disagreeable. I don't necessarily think you need to not pick your battles. Yeah. Pick your weapons, right? Sure. Like, like going to IG <laughs> probably is not the the safest move to stay. The starting in that. point. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I was torching bridges like crazy, and then it fucking caught up to me, and I got put in a position where I was supervising five people instead of you know at the time I think we were supervising 40, 40 50 people. Yeah. Um, so I don't think you should pick your battles. I think if it's I think if it's a battle worth fighting you fight it but i think it's important you weigh you know how hard you got to go I, th I think that's yeah. a big piece i think that's a really big piece so your your defiance is much more productive than mine let me i'll let you categorize <laughs> which which one of these good flight chief or bad flight chiefs these should go into uh so i at one point took this is when I was a doc chief, so I took my whole section at the time to the bowling alley instead of going to a commander's call. That's fucking good. <laughs> and we just, like, we kind of hid out in the 
like they had a little casino area with the doors that automatically closed until yep. everybody started coming out. Uh, I got put in charge of like this mandatory PT. So I had everybody bring a dollar and then we went to the pool and just hung out at the pool for like <laughs> six sessions. Do they call you Easter Benny at work? Is that <laughs> something they call you? It seems like something they might call you. <laughs> no, those are like proud moments though. Like <laughs> they're super, super shitty and like petty and defiant, but. No, I'll tell you what. Fun. I'll tell you what. Like how I see that, the, the bigger thing is that taking your people to go bowling instead of the commander's call, like that, the ass chewing you got probably sucked. But I'll tell you what. I bet your guys fucking, I bet it, I bet it, I bet it, it was huge. Because everybody knows Commander's Call is bullshit. There's never Nothing. a time I walked out of Commander's Call like, fuck, I'm really glad oh I went God. to that Commander's Call. <laughs> I fucking learned a lot of that Commander's I Call. I so much information. You walk out of Commander's Call and you immediately text your buddy on the other shift going, there's no sign-up sheet. That's what you fucking do when you walk out of Commander's <laughs> Call. Or I signed you on the sign-in sheet. Yeah, like, so like, recognizing something that's stupid and recognizing that if you're, if you have to put the tools away for an hour, your people are better served to go bowling, have a beer than go listen to a windbag. Unless you have like a fucking great commander. Um, but no, uh, I, I would, I, uh, I would say that was a good battle. I, I would, uh, the PT one that probably was cost you more than it was worth type of deal. <laughs> but the bowling thing, but rec you know, because you're basically telegraphing to all your guys, I know it's bullshit. You know it's bullshit. I'm not lying to you that it's fucking worthwhile to be there. And we're going to go bowling instead, and that's going to be more value added. So, no, I wouldn't. I would say that's good. It's even better if you don't get caught. <laughs> did you get caught? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I did not. So, your guys never, like, spilled that? No. Well, oh, yeah. it was pretty, it was, uh, I was doc chief at Coonsong. Mm. So it was no. like eight, eight dudes. Yeah. Fucking well done. In fact, anybody <laughs> watching this, that's something I would recommend doing. Like, that's good. Like, that's a good lesson learned. That's not a failure. <laughs> and really what it kind of amounts to, and I can't remember if I've ever said this before was, you know, when, um, I was the MC for Eric Munson's retirement, and I, I think this had a real profound effect on me because after this, I kind of fucking went off the rails. Um, when I was an MC for Eric Munson's retirement, we were walking back from the squadron from picking up some certificate or something. I turned to him and asked him, because he was at 24 years or something like that. I turned to him and asked him, I said, hey, Eric, you know, for your entire career, what is the thing that you want to pass along to me? What is your words of wisdom that you can tell me? And he said, Chris, all the shit I was fucking always worried about, none of it fucking matters. When I look back on it, none of it matters. All the times I was pissed off the jet was the eight hour fix rate was busted and I yelled and screamed and I treat people, you know, all that stuff. Now I'm retiring and none of it matters. And that to me really kind of stuck. And I'll tell you what, as somebody that's retired and I know, you know, both probably Kenny and John can back me up on this. Like if I had gotten so, you know, warped around the axle over a lost tool or, you know, a guy that was late or he didn't have a haircut or his uniform was dirty. And, you know, going back to what you said, where you, you know, you write an LOR, you don't realize his wife has just left him or something like none of that shit matters. I, I really can't communicate that enough. Now I am two years retired ish. Yeah. Two years retired ish. I can't imagine the guilt I would feel that if I hem somebody up, or even those guys I hemmed up over the dick on the board. If somebody had gone home and blown their brains out that night, how do I make peace with that as a retiree where I got so angry over something that didn't fucking matter and I affected somebody else? And that just goes back to the commander's call thing. It doesn't – most of the time it doesn't fucking matter. It just doesn't. Commanders are directed to do it like monthly at best, quarterly if they can. They bring in some guest speaker. They have some 
some awards that most people don't even want to get up on stage for. They just want to get it fucking handed to them because there's the awkward salute and shit like that. And your flight chief or your chief is all worried because somebody needs to sit in the front row. And then there's people falling asleep because they're coming off ship. Like none of that shit fucking matters. Like somebody falling asleep during a briefing by a four-star general because he was up all night humping trying to get the jet fixed and somebody says he needs to be at this stupid fucking briefing to hear the shit from a guy that's going to be gone in two years that has no real capability to make his life better and he fucking falls asleep because, by the way, he's a human being and he fucking falls asleep when he's tired. And then you chew his ass? That shit doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. I just, I just realize, I'll just say this. When you're out of the military, you still got to be a person. You still got to make peace with what happened while you're in the service. And a lot of the shit that you get worked up over, and I don't mean you as in you. I mean you as in whoever's watching this. Where all the shit you get worked up over, it doesn't matter. And if somebody blows their brains out for it or their marriage fucking ends because you drug them in on a weekend to clean floors or any other dumb shit that's going on, it doesn't matter. And if you're a good person, you'll feel fucking terrible for it. And if you're not a good person, I guess, well, you don't have to fucking worry about it. And you're probably not watching this video anyway. And I think it's hard for people to understand, like, both. It's hard to say both. It's almost like a paradox of none of this shit matters. And then in the same breath say, this is, this is bigger than you. You're doing something that is bigger than you. And you're part of an, of an organization that does stuff, like, yeah. a, like national level stuff. And you, like, you swore an oath that you have to hold, but also none of this matters. So Not like none of this. The... Being able to tell the little shit from the big shit. The big right, shit is exactly. what makes the mission go. The fact that you fucking forgot your hat and you walked from the parking lot to the building without a hat on, that doesn't fucking matter. It so just doesn't. For some of my airmen that I've I encountered, like, it's hard for them to separate that. Like that, not wearing your hat to your car is the same thing as you didn't fix this jet. And it's hard like for a group one. chief to separate those things, let alone an airman. I've known group chiefs to get fucking sent out. I'm going to fucking write an angry email. Like, like, are you fucking high right now? You're sending an email out to all the chiefs. You're putting all the chiefs on blast because some fucking airman forgot his hat. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Anyway. Yeah, it's this weird balance of... Would it would everything fall apart? Right. Well, there's this there's this weird sort of mantra that if you pay attention to the little stuff, the big stuff takes care of itself. That's not fucking true. Like if I get a haircut and I shine my boots back when you used to shine your boots, but whatever. If I do all the little things, it's still not going to fucking change the goddamn ADG on the jet. That's not going to fucking happen. Like that's stupid. Anybody that thinks that is an idiot. Attention to detail is important for an ADG. Attention to detail is not important for my bootlaces being tucked in. And if I don't tuck in my bootlaces, that doesn't mean I didn't do the safety wire on the ADG because I'm a human being and I recognize one is more fucking important than the other. And I give the other one way more fucking of my attention than my boots. But I digress. Well, uh, we've been talking for an hour and a half and I don't know if anybody's gonna has made it this far. Um, I guess... The, really, we'll look at a final thoughts. Is there anything that you want to, you know, uh, the audience of this is going to be probably, you know, new section chiefs or section chiefs or maybe people are about to be section chiefs or trying to understand why their section chief are the way they are. What advice do you have? Just one thing, Chris, and I think you said I got it from you and I kind of use it, but I just want your, your take on, in your own words. And it's the Air Force's uh, fourth core value. Do you remember what it is? No. I don't think you Perception got it. is reality. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so what's, what's your take on perception is reality? I think I just – I think if people are, are, are focused on appearance over substance, which is really what we're talking about, right? Perception is reality. How it looks is more important than what it is. That's part think, of it. And then, like, the piece that I preach is that, like, if somebody thinks something, then that that's literally what their reality is, even if it's not truth. No, that's true. Which kind of ties into that. It does. But it's like, I wish we 
I wish the Air Force had the capability to recognize the individual contributions for what they really were instead of and, and all the and all the 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 efforts that went into that, all the, the nuances of individual experiences and recognizing that you can't one size fits all leadership anybody. But you know just because what someone is kind of presenting isn't necessarily what it is. And some people certainly deserve more than one chance. Uh, and, and the Air Force is uh, no mistake, one mistake, whatever the fuck it is. But, you know, people are tired. People are under-resourced. People feel pinched because they feel like they have to make magic and a lot of times to make magic, they have to lower the quality, they have to cut corners, and then they're held responsible for that. Just recognize that your people are operating. They're doing the best they can. And if it looks bad, give them the benefit of the doubt, I guess. I mean, that's kind of the best I can I can say. People. Take care of them. <laughs> Kenny? <Nope. laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> I, I just say, like, enjoy yourself. I think a lot of times when you're in that position, you don't get to enjoy your time in there. So just take it for what it is and enjoy yourself while you're in there. So. I think that's a good – I think that's that's pretty profound. I think, I think in most positions in the Air Force, you have a hard time appreciating what it is when you're in it, but certainly section chief. Because I felt genuine grief when I got, you know, shit canned uh, like three times after I was a section chief. And it, it felt like it was specific that they didn't want me supervising people anymore. And I really realized that I missed just rallying a section and getting the mission done and bringing people together and providing, you know, top cover for them you know, all the things that go into being a section chief, like, yeah, appreciate it when you're in the moment. It may not feel like it. And you might be thinking about the next job so you can make senior or whatever it might be, but, you know, cherish the kind of the, the, the time there. Okay. Well, uh, I can't tell you how much, uh, I appreciate you guys. Um, you know, taking an hour and a half, hour and two, hour and forty-five minutes out of your day to kind of talk um, about this. Um, yeah, so it was good to see you. Certainly, Kenny, it was good to see you. I haven't talked to Kenny in uh, you know probably wow. three years now. Yeah. Much longer for me. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, that's it. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. All right, appreciate now. it. Have a good one.